All right, guys, I actually taught Josh as a Okay. Who found something? Come on, this is your timer. I'm going to start chapter one. I don't have time to say my Number three. Number three. The building was purchased eight years ago. This year it was appraised for this. Find the linear equation that represents the value of the building X years after purchase. So, at purchase time, the uh, cost of the house was 137.5, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Eight years later, remember, X, X is X years after purchase. So when we purchase it, X would be zero, and X, or eight years later, X would be eight, and the value after eight years was 102,000. Everybody got that? They defined the variable. If they don't define the variable for you, you can let X be whatever you want, and then your ordered pairs might look different. But when they tell you this is what X stands for, then you have to set up your ordered pairs that way. All right, find a linear equation. That's just a fancy way of saying write the equation of the line. So what do we need to write the equation of the line? Well, we need the slope. So 102,000 minus 137,500 over eight minus zero. Does this look okay to you? Yep. So those are big numbers. Um, what do we come up with? Negative 35 pi over 8. Now wait, this slope is going to be a negative number, isn't it? Does that make sense? The value is going down, right? This house is depreciating. It is going down. So I'm going to divide by 8. And that's negative 4437.5. Four, if you have wacky word numbers like this, you're going to be allowed to use your calculator. Don't panic. But if they're numbers like 0, 10, 8, 13, then you're going to do it by hand. All right, so now what? Well, this one is handy. You can point slope if you want. But what is that point right there? What does that point happen to be? That's the y-intercept. Think about plotting that point. Wouldn't it be on the y-axis? Yeah. So that's your b. So your linear function or linear equation is y equals negative 4437.5x plus 137.5. Could you do point slope or something? Absolutely you could. But when they hand you the y-intercept, you know, might as well just use it. When, or what will the building be worth 13 years after it was purchased? So now we just put 13 in. So this is the answer to A. The answer to B is negative 4437.5 times 13 plus 137. Five. Does that make sense to everybody? So you just type in whatever it says, that's how many dollars it's worth. That's the answer to the question. Okay? Who has another one? Okay, number two. That's it for that one. All right, number two, an airplane climbs a takeoff with a slope of two sevenths. So visualize that for a minute. Visualize that. Here's the airplane climbing. And the ratio, if the slope is 2 sevenths, doesn't that mean this is 2 and this is 7? Yeah. So if you want, you can write an equation that says y equals 2 sevenths x. That describes this line right here. If you want, you don't have to do that, but that would be an option. How high off the ground will the airplane be after it flies 250,000 feet in the horizontal direction. Well, if you've written an equation, then you would put 250,000 in for x and figure out y. 
You could also set up a proportion that looks like this. Does that proportion make sense to you? That the rise over the run is something over this run? It's going to give you exactly the same answer. Okay? And you would want to put a unit on that answer feet. All right, who else? Let's go. Did you, Finley. Did you do 8D? 8. I don't know how to solve it. 8. D or E, what did you say? D. D, 8D. Oh, yes, you know how to solve that. I know the answer, I don't know how to do it. You know how to solve that. So X cubed minus X is greater than zero. Would you agree with that? Yeah. How would I factor X cubed minus X? Take an X out. Take an X out. GCF. Right? Does that factor yeah. into what? X plus 1, X minus X plus one. 1, X minus 1. All right. Now, this is an inequality. Inequalities always involve shading. So I'm going to go ahead and draw my number line. And it's going to have three dots on it because, after all, this was an X cubed equation. Where will those dots be? That's zero right there, negative one and one. So I'm going to put them on here in order. It's a number line. So put them on in order. And then somewhere there's going to be shading on here, and I have to figure out where. So I might, I might, it doesn't matter where you start, but I'm, I might just start down here and say, okay, should two be shaded? Here's where two is. Should that be shaded? Well, if I plug in 2 and I'm bigger than 0, yes, it should be shaded. So I'm going to plug in 2. You can do it up here. It might be easier, actually, to do it up there. 2 cubed minus 2 is 6. Is 6 bigger than 0? Yes. Yes. So this gets shaded. Now, you can do the same thing with every section if you want. But you don't need to. Did I tell you the super secret shortcut? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's no repeated factors. I didn't use the same dot twice, in other words. So I alternate. So since I shaded that one, I won't shade this one. And I will shade this one, and I won't shade that one. So my answer is negative 1 to 0 or 1 to infinity. Remember that now, Finley? All right, who else? Can you do one? An open box, okay. And we did one of these the other day. We're cutting the corners out of the paper, folding them up, and making a box. Um, so here's my piece of paper. The dimensions of the paper are 22 by 14. I'm cutting these corners out. They are X big, right? Hold up the flaps. I want a volume of at least 210. So I need an equation that expresses volume. What will the volume of this box be? Length times width times height. Now keep in mind, the original paper was 14, but what did we do? Took out 2x. Cut an x off each side. So that will be 14 minus 2x. The original paper was 22, but I took an x off each end. And then, so that's length and width. What's the height? X. Just x. Now, that's the volume of the box. We need the volume to be at least 210. So doesn't that mean greater than or equal to 210? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is 100% a calculator problem. So what I, you do your own thing. What I would do is I would type in this as one equation, this as another equation, 
and look for parts of the resulting picture where this is higher than that. But before you do that, we need to talk about that window. I don't know how it's set. It doesn't matter. We're going to change it. Tell me about x min and max. In other words, domain. X min and max on this problem. Think about what x stands for. What is your minimum x? Zero. Zero. Sydney, what's your maximum x? Seven. Seven, yep. So your x min is zero, your x max is seven. The smallest dimension is 14. You cannot take off more than half of 14. Right? Okay, now what about our y's? Minimum is zero. Well, technically, yeah, but when I graph this thing, aren't I, if I do it with intersections, aren't I gonna put a line at 210? Right? So I can go all the way down to zero if I want and then up to, I don't know, 250 or something. But you could actually just kind of sandwich 210 and maybe do 100 to 300 or something. That would be up to you. That would be up to you. You're solving for x. So this is the important part right here. These are our x's. So let's go ahead. We do need to see if they intersect. Oops. Remember, there is no need to FOIL or anything. You can type that right in with those parentheses just fine. I used uh, 100 and 300, and the picture I got looks like this. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. The picture I got looks like this. Here's 100, here's 300. And then there's this line coming across in the middle. So this is the point, these are the points I need, right? sections, those are the points you need. So let's find them. Has anybody found them yet just to save time? Uh, zero, so what was it? 0. 0.8? 39. 39. And 5.261. 261. So what do those two points represent? That's where the volume is exactly 210. But I am interested not only in equaling 210, but also being greater than 210. So where is it greater than 210? All of this, right? Between. So your in between them. So your answer will be 0.839, comma, 5.261. Those are the x values that will produce a volume equal to or greater than 210. Yes? Then we got what? Okay, I want you to think about this for a second, Tess. I want you to think about it. Hand me a piece of that paper. Here's my piece of paper. Look at me. Here's my piece of paper, right? I'm gonna rip a corner off each side. Like this, this is what is happening, and I'm going to fold up the flap. I'm going to get on all sides and fold it up. Do you understand that? Okay. Now, this is 14 across. So I'm cutting a piece off here and a piece off here. So if the piece I cut off is one inch, then this would now be 12. 14 minus this inch and that inch, right? So I could take off two inches on each side. And then what would be left? 14 minus 4. Well, can I take off eight inches from each side? Not if it's only 14 across, because eight on this side and eight on this side would be 16, but I only have 14 to start with, right? 
So if I ripped it right in the middle, it would be seven on each side. Can't possibly be bigger than that. It can't even be seven, because if it were, I wouldn't have anything left to fold up and make a box. But it can be everything up to seven. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. All right, what else? That takes care of that one. What else do we have to talk about? All of um. It is 8B. 8B. It's an absolute value. It's an absolute value problem. Now, you may do the absolute value problem however you wish. I am going to do it. So, so you're not going to lose. How you do it is up to you. That's an individual choice. I am going to do it, though, kind of the, the calculus way, the distance way. So I'm going to start by dividing everything by 4. So I have x minus 3 fourths is greater than or equal to 5 fourths. And then I'm going to think about this as find all the numbers whose distance from 3 fourths is bigger than 5 fourths. So here's 3 fourths on the number line. If I count 5 fourths both ways, so add 5 fourths and subtract 5 fourths. Let's see, this would be 3 plus 5, that's 2. Yep. 3 minus 5, this is negative a half. These two points are exactly 5 fourths away from 3 fourths. I want to be more than that. So where are the points that are more than that? On the outside. On the outside. So your answer is negative infinity to negative one-half or two to infinity. Now, no matter how you do this problem, that should be the answer that you end up with. Okay. Okay? All right. Who else? Yes? So I have a question. On that one, if it was like breath plus three fourths. If it was what? Breath plus three fourths. Uh -huh. Then this point would be negative. You go five fourths both ways, no matter what, you would just be starting at negative three fourths. Okay, that, that wouldn't change. This wouldn't change. But if this this has to be a difference. If you do it this way, that has to be a difference. So if it's a plus, you gotta think about it as x minus negative three fourths. I just remember every time you take a number out of a parentheses and the absolute value acts like a parenthesis, it's the opposite. So when this said x minus 3 fourths, when I bring it out, it's going to be a positive 3 fourths. Just like when you solve your equation and you get this, don't you say x equals 4? Yeah, same concept. All right, who else? Yep, Josh. 4. four. Forces. Okay, now you need to know our projectile motion formula. Which I can't remember. I normally make you memorize it. I, I didn't tell you I'd give it to you, did I? No. So your projectile motion formula is this. And we talked about what all those things mean. So let's, that, that's like the general. We need to customize it for this problem. So the height at time t, what's my initial velocity? 100. What's my initial height? 24. So this is the customized equation. When you, before you can use the formula, you have to plug in your initial velocity and your initial height. Those will be given. I know we talked about special situations. If you drop something, the initial velocity is zero. zero. If it's starting on the ground, like a firecracker, 
the initial height is zero. Otherwise, they're actually going to put the numbers into it like they did here, and you're going to know. All right, so this is our equation that we're going to use. When will the height above the ground be at least 50? Kids, remember, this guy right here is the height above the ground. So you can think of this as h. This is function notation. Remember last year when you had a simple little linear function and your teacher said, oh, you can think about that as y? I'm going to think about it as h because it's the height above the ground if I'm confused by the function notation. So I, my equation involves a height and a time. When will the height be at least 50? Where do I put the 50 in that equation? Right here, right? So I want my height, this is my height, to be at least 50? Yeah. If it equaled 50, I would just set it equal to 50. I want it greater than 50. Now, could I do this problem the same way I did, what was that other one? The box problem? Could I do this one by typing on, in this on one side? Yes. And this on the other side? Yes. And then looking for where they cross? And then where the, this will be a parabola, where the parabola is higher than the line? Yep. Couldn't they do that? Yep. So that would be your strategy. So you're going to put in this as one equation, well, a, a possible strategy. Put this in as one equation, put this in as the other. You're going to get a picture that looks like this. This is where it actually equals 50. And this is where it's greater than 50. So it's very similar to the box problem that we did a minute ago. Would we also just set our window to this? Well, you, for this particular problem, what's t, t is your domain variable. What does T stand for? Time. time. So your minimum time is going to be zero. And there really isn't a maximum time other than when it hits the ground. And I don't know that yet. I think that's the next question. Um, so at this point, no, because you're looking for just this part. If, Leah, you were looking for where it is less than 50, then you would need it because from zero to whatever this point is, or from zero to here and from here to here, would be when it's less than 50. So you would need that. Well, we're going to find it anyway in the second part, but you would need it on the first part if it were less than. Then how do you like see where it, we're getting upset? Well, you're not seeing anything. Well, so you make manual adjustments on your calculator until you see it. So do you see a parabola? I do. OK. This is 50. That's y equals 50. Yeah. So, so just make sure you're high enough to be 50. Do they cross? It's possible they don't cross. They do. They do. They do. All right. So she's going to work on that. Figure out where they where they cross. Now, what would be the case if they didn't cross? It's totally possible, especially if I'm sitting there at midnight trying to throw a test together, right? What would be the situation if they didn't cross? The well, yeah. But the ball. This says when is the ball at least 50? What if the ball only gets up to 32 or something? Could that happen? Yeah. Yes. And so then when you try to grab them, then you would not get an intersection. You would see your parabola down here and your line up here. And that simply means it never happens. But he says they do cross. So anybody else get them to cross? If it doesn't cross, then it's just no solution. No, it never gets that high. Yep. When will the ball yeah. answer the question? When will the ball be higher than 50? Never. It doesn't go that high. Right? This is a word problem. So they answer in context. But they do intersect. Okay. That's, that's kind of what we said. You were the one that said you couldn't see it. So I said it's possible. I said it's possible they don't. 
But then Peter and Alexis said they do intersect. Yeah. And I said, okay, then you're going to work on that and find out where the intersect is. you did. Yeah. So your answer, I don't, what were these two numbers? Were they intersecting? I have one. Okay. Point two seven. <laughs> point two seven. And what's the other one? 5.97. So when is the ball at least 50 feet above the ground between these two times, right? Assuming those are right. The answers are in school. Is he right? Five seems awfully big to me. It's five point, I got 5.98. Okay. Perfect. I think it is. Okay. Now, when will the object hit the ground? So the first thing we did is figure out when it was going to be at least 50 feet high. Now we want to know when it hits the ground. We want to know that point right there. Okay? So what are you going to do? Instead of putting greater than or equal to 50 over here, you're going to put equals zero. zero. Isn't that when the ball is on the ground? Yep. Now, you can graph that. Um, you're going to find two answers. Uh, by the way, if you graph this, you're looking for the zeros, right? Where does it cross the x-axis? And you're going to get two answers, but probably one of them is negative, mm -hmm. which means you throw it out, and the only right answer is the positive one that you get. So you'll type in this equation, and then second calc zero, And did you get 7.9? I got 6.48. 6.48. You're getting all kinds of different answers. Anybody get one of those? 6.48. We're going with 6.48. That's when it hits the ground. So, um, Leah, was it you? This is what this really looks like. Was it you that said, so how do I set that window? Yeah. Well, if I were interested, if I needed the domain of this problem, my x would be from 0 to 6.48. Because that's it. After that, the ball is done. Right? This is the negative answer you get back here. That's the one you're going to throw out. We don't want that one. We only want the positive one. All right, who else? Let's go. The minute you stop asking questions is the moment I start chapter one. Uh, so let's go. Eight. Tess? This is point two seven. Should be what you got when you did it. You don't know how to do it? Okay. Tess, the calculator always works. The operator sometimes doesn't work, but the calculator always works. Does, does it have power or is it out of batteries? No, it has not power. It's just whenever I, when I try graphing it, it just says like quit or like go back to the station. Okay, so what does that mean? That means one or two, it doesn't give you any kind of error message, it just quits? Um, well, it, it gives me like quit or like go back. Like, All right, let's find the questions So her calculator does give her a specific error message. It does say quit for sure, but above it it says error syntax. What does a syn what does a syntax error mean? What did she do wrong? Wrote it wrong. She wrote it wrong. She typed it in wrong. And you know what she did? I can tell by looking at it. When you type a negative 16, where do you get the negative? Down below. It's not a minus sign. You're not subtracting. That's where you get So, when you get an error, it tells you what kind of error it is. If it says syntax, you type it in wrong. If it says domain, then you got your window wrong. Or sometimes it says error window range or something. That means your window's wrong. Figure it out. If your 
your stat plot, if your plot is turned on, remember how we had those tables and we plotted points? If your plot is on, for some calculators, that will interfere with the graphing too. So you should just never turn your plot on unless you want to plot points. Otherwise, your plot should be off because it just causes trouble. For most calculators, not for all. What does it mean when it says error and no sign change? It means you have tried to set your bounds mm -hmm. and they're both on one side of the point. You have to be on both sides of the point. So when you are looking, let's say you're looking for this point, Sydney, mm -hmm. okay? You are looking for where the curve goes from being positive to negative. So we set it over here, it's positive on this side, it's negative on this side. So okay. we have positives, this side's positive, that side's negative. If you have them both over here, then you're not surrounding your point, and they're both positive. If there's no sign change, you can't find a zero. Zero is between positive and negative, right? Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. All right, so what else What else have we found? Have you been sitting here, Allison? Seven. Seven. Find the coordinates of Q. If, <laughs> all right, so here's PQ. I am looking for Q. P is negative 8, 4. Q is 1 fifth, comma, negative 7. I mean, the midpoint is 1 fifth, negative 7. And my job is to find Q. Right? Yeah. So, I can think of a couple ways right off the bat to do this. What's one way I could do this? How do you find midpoint? Take the average. average. So kind of the meat and potatoes way would be negative eight plus x divided by two has to be one fifth. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The average of negative eight and x has to be one fifth. So I'll cross multiply. Negative 40 plus 5x equals 2. 5x equals 42. So x is 42 fifths. Yeah. And then rinse and repeat with the y's. So 4 plus y over 2 equals negative 7. So 4 plus y equals negative 14 and y equals negative 18. So there's your point. That actually might be the easiest way for x anyhow because of the fractional involvement. But for y, I would say, okay, from 4 to negative 7 is backing up 11. So I'll just back up another 11, and wouldn't that put me at negative 18? So with integers, that's kind of easy to do. If you got all these weird fractions, it's probably just easiest to cross multiply. Okay, doesn't matter. Somehow, that's the answer you gotta come out with. All right, what else? Do we do, um, uh, this says? Find N. So that's all, this is kind of the same thing. Slope. Y, y minus y over x minus x. So they tell me that if I do n minus 12, 5 minus negative 1, I should end up with negative 3 elevenths. Yeah. So negative 3 elevenths equals n minus 12 over 6. I think I'll just cross multiply again. So 11n equals 4. I got 4 elevenths. Did I do that right? I'm hearing people saying I'm right. I love that. I love to be right. Especially since I'm on media. Josh? 
Oh, I dropped the 12. Thank you. It is not. I lost the one right there. Thank you. So I wasn't right. And I'm on video. Okay. 11 and, um, what is that, 132? 132. Yeah, I got to be careful. I got to be careful. And then that's 114. 114. So how about that answer? 114 over That's what I got. Okay. <laughs> now we got it. Okay, thank you. All right, what else? Eight E. Eight. Eight E is a quadratic inequality. So we already did an inequality earlier, but it was uh, cubic. So there were three dots on the number line. This one will have just two. And I'm using a number line because it's an inequality. And in an inequality, I always have the shade. Right? So I know that eventually there are going to be two dots on my number line. And since it's a less than, they will be shaded in between. So I have my answer if I only knew the, the numbers, right? So this is a quadratic, and you basically need to solve it to find these two numbers. So what can you do with a quadratic? You can try to factor it. Now, there's, there's some messiness here, and there's no guarantee of factors, but some people are, I'm not one of those, are really, really good at seeing the right combination. So if it factors, if you can factor it, then that would be these two dots, right? What if you're me, and I'll make mistakes like this, and I can't factor it, I don't see how to factor it, Okay. What could I do? Quadratic formula. Quadratic formula. Or you, can do you could complete the square, but I wouldn't because I have to divide by three. No. And that's going to be really messy. So, does anybody happen to see how it factors? Yes. We got one. Austin? 3x plus 4 and x plus 9. Here we go. So, let's make sure we're all clear. Remember, I'm sitting there writing this test at midnight. I'm exhausted. People have been yelling at me all day long. I've been making mistakes. My mind's somewhere else. Probably the problem isn't going to factor. Okay? So what do I do if it doesn't factor? Okay. Use the quadratic formula or complete the square. Whichever way I like best or whichever seems appropriate. Because you have one job, and that is to figure out where these dots are. So the factors tell me that the dots are at negative four thirds, oops, negative four thirds and negative nine. And I have to make sure they're in order. This is a number line. Since it's a less than, I shade in between, right? When you have two dots in between or outside, depending on the sign. So my answer is negative nine and negative four thirds. This checks. That checks. That's the right factoring. Okay. Yeah. With the problem. Two D nine. Consider these numbers. Which which numbers in that list are natural numbers? Remember. Okay. I got four little grandbabies. Ages one and three. We count all the time. Grandma counts with them all the time. Oh, what numbers do I count with with my little grandchildren? grandchildren. One, two, one, two, one, two, three. three. Those are the natural one, numbers, the naturally one, occurring one, numbers. So look at the list. Which one of those are in that set? Six. six. And the square root of 16. Because the square root of 16 is four. four. Those are the counting numbers. Now, we haven't yet discussed irrational numbers with my grandchildren who are one and three. But what do I know about irrational numbers? Non-repeating non or non-repeating non and non-terminating 
decimals. How do I recognize them? Well, I got the ones I always recognize, like pi and e. And then if they've got a radical in them that doesn't go away, like root 16, that one goes away. But root 10 does not. So root 10 is the only irrational number in that list. But you'll say, well, Miss Ford, what about 3i? 3i is not even real. If you are irrational, you gotta be real, first of all, right? Real numbers are rational or irrational. If you are not real, you are not even one of those things. Wait, is every number a complex number? Every number is a complex number. Is there any exceptions? Uh, to that? Huh? Are there any exceptions to that? So imaginary numbers only fall under the umbrella of complex? Yes. yes. Okay. So what is complex? What's the point? A plus bi. Anything in the form a plus bi. So if a is zero, then you just have an i. If b is zero, then you just have that, but it still oh. fits that pattern. So the zero for the i means there's not an i. Yep. Yep. So yep. is every number a complex yes. number? Yes. Why did they make complex numbers to everything? Well, they had to have some way of describing the combination of pure imaginary numbers with real numbers. And so they said they were called those complex numbers. Because it's a combination of both. I mean, there, it's the two kinds put together in the same number. All right, what else? Can you go over all 10? These are properties. All right, what's A? What's it say? Transitive of inequality. Kids, if there are two properties, like there's two transitive properties, you have to identify which one it is. There's two commutative properties, you have to identify which one it is. Addition or multiplication. The transitive is equality or inequality. This is the transitive property of inequality. All right, what's B? Multiple, yep, it's the multiplication property of equality. So you can write mult equals, it's the multiplication property of equality. That's the property that says, give me an equation, I can multiply both sides by three. All right, what's C? Associative. The order hasn't changed. We went from grouping or associating the Y plus Z to associating the X and Y. Your mother at some point in your life has said, I don't want you to associate with that kid. She doesn't want you grouped with that kid. When you talk about grouping, you're talking about how things are associated. So we say associative of addition. That's the associative of addition. All right, what about D? Commutative of, mul of multiplication. I was put the wrong one. Okay, so D, D is the commutative of multiplication. The word commutative, listen to it, commutative does not have a name. Commutative. That's one of my pet Okay, E, what's that one? Identity. Additive identity, or identity of addition. Somehow have identity and addition in the same thing, and that's it. Yeah. Okay, this isn't um, one of the um, problem solvers, but I just have a question about complex numbers, like when we're doing like using I imaginary numbers. When you get an answer that's in the form of like A plus B I, so like let's say four plus four I, mm -hmm. if you were to get like negative four plus four I, isn't it that A can't, can A be a negative amount? Oh yeah. It can? Oh yeah. Okay. A can be anything real. A okay. can be a radical. A can be pi. It can be anything. As long as, so it just has to be, a real number? Mm -hmm. That's the definition of complex numbers. A plus B I, where A and B are real. So you could have a number like root 2 plus pi I. That's a complex number because root 2 and pi are both real numbers. Right? Yeah. Okay, what else? Yep. Could you do 11D? 11D is just a simplified situation. So we are going to simplify.
There is something you must do the moment you see this. Take out. I root three. You've got to do that. I root six. You've got to do that. What's that? Two I. That's right, two I. Right? Now, it's a multiplication problem. So I have I times I times I, which is IQ. And uh, yep, I'm gonna get there in a minute. And then I have two root 18. Right? Yes. Yeah. Now, IQ, remember, is I squared times I, but I squared is negative, negative one. So this is negative I. Root 18 is uh, three, three radical two. Three radical two. So I have two times three radical two, six which two. gives me six, six radical two yeah. times negative i. So most, like the typical way of writing that is negative six i root two. Negative six i root two. <sighs> I just had a, com a question about complex numbers. Mm -hmm. If it's over a fraction, do all three have to cancel out? Yes. So if you had, if you had six plus twelve i over three, that problem reduces because three can go into all of those. But if you had six plus eleven i, eleven i over twelve, that does not reduce because you can't take anything out of all three. Same thing if you're doing the quadratic formula, let's say, and you get an answer like um, five plus or minus um, two root 17 over 10. You cannot cancel here because five, 10, and two all need to cancel. 17 is irrelevant. We don't care what's under the radical, but these guys all have to cancel. It's a triangle, okay? Can you do 11B? Uh, 11B? Well, the rule states that you cannot have an I in the denominator. And you might be wondering why, but let's go back. Let's go back to the original rule, which was you can't have a radical in the denominator. What's I? Uh, so it, it makes sense that it can't be down there either. So, you have an option here. Uh, you approach this, you always have options. But your goal is to get rid of the i. So, you can, or you can just multiply by i. Because what happens if I just multiply by i? That becomes i squared. I get i squared, which is negative 1, and no more i's in the bottom. So, that would be negative 3 when you go on the bottom. And then on the top, I'll distribute. But now I have an I squared, so that would be minus five. five. Yeah. Now, a couple of things. First of all, that prop that problem's fine. You're gonna get full credit for it, but it is considered backwards. Normally we would write it this way. Okay? The second thing is. If there was something besides 3i, let's say, let's go back to the original problem. Let's say on the bottom, we had 2 plus 3i. Now, timesing by i is not going to work because timesing by i would take care of this, but it would put one here, yeah. so it wouldn't fix anything. So if you've got a, a sum or a difference down here, you know, a whole complex number down there, you're going to multiply that one by the conjugate, top and bottom. Could I have done that with my original problem? Yes. It's just more arithmetic, more canceling, but you absolutely can always multiply by the conjugate if that's what you want to do. Time for one more question. One more. Let's go. Okay, Sarah, you haven't asked a question yet. Is your hand up? I can't tell. You're going like this. You, you're the one going like this. Uh, no, I was. You're good. Yes. All right, Josh. Eleven C. Eleven C. 
I'll get down as much as I can. You may have to look at the answer sheet. So, if I'm doing this problem, really? Quiet. Quiet. The first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to do, you might do differently. The first thing I'm going to do is simplify my individual parentheses. So my first parentheses, I'm going to have my 3 and my 4. I have a leftover A on the bottom. I have two Bs and a C on the top. So that's the first thing I'm going to do is collect or clean up, combine anything I can in this one. Yeah, three on the top and one on the bottom, right? <laughs> now, five, six, I'm doing the same thing. My A's are coming up, so I got six of them up here. My B's are coming down, so I got four of them down here. And that one is just plain square. You do not have to do it this way, this order. I like to do that. Now, that negative is going to turn this over. So I'm going to go ahead, flip it over, and then that becomes a positive 2 when I flip my fraction over. Now I'm going to square everything. 16a squared, 9b4c squared, 25a12, 36b. I squared everything. Now I'm going to start to move this mess up. I can cross cancel maybe using cross canceling.